If you're new to us today, we're in a series on prayer. We can make prayer really complicated, but we've tried to make it simple and complicated. The simple part today is prayer is a relationship with God. Prayer is how we talk to God, how we listen to God. Prayer is how we keep that relationship connected. And throughout this summer, we're asking 10 questions on prayer. Today's question is, does prayer change me? Does prayer change me? And to study this really important question, I want to bring you to a great Old Testament story. The story is in the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, the 32nd chapter. So open up a Bible or a phone. I want you to follow along. I want you to see this story for yourself. Genesis 32, it's a story of Jacob's wrestling match. Now as you're finding your way to this story, I want to introduce this biblical character to you. Now it might surprise you to hear this, especially if you're new to the Christian faith, but this is pretty consistently true, that most of the characters in the Bible are a mess. Like, not if you know that that's true. Most of the characters in the Bible are a mess. They have significant flaws. They have closets full of skeletons. They have character deficiencies that would result in them never passing a background check, right? Like, if, if early, the early version of Moses or Abraham or Paul were to apply for a job at Christ Community Church, we would have screened them out in the first round of the interviews. But what makes the Christian story so compelling to me, and hopefully to you, is that God uses people who are a mess. God uses people who have messes in the present, God uses messes in the past, and God in some way orchestrates all these messes to accomplish his good purpose. God uses people with messes to tell great stories about who he is. And today's story is a person that is clearly a mess. Jacob is a mess. In fact, Jacob is a jerk. He was born a jerk. Seriously, the Bible does not tell one redeeming characteristic about Jacob until he's well into his 30s. If you think your parents were hard on you, right? There's nothing really good about this guy. When he's born, he's the youngest of two twins. His older brother's Esau. Esau comes out first. Jacob is grabbing at Esau's heel. That's how he gets his name, Jacob, which means heel grabber or deceiver. And that's what he's always doing. His entire life is trying to catch up to people, trying to pull others down to pull himself up. When he gets older, he tricks his brother Esau of a significant portion of the family inheritance. And then when his fa father is on his deathbed blind, he deceives his father, impersonates his brother Esau so that he could get Esau's blessing as well. So Esau, his older brother, doesn't like him. In fact, he wants to kill him. He's got the motive now and he's got methods. He's stronger, he's bigger, he's skilled with outdoorsy things. And so Jacob has to go on a run. He has to run away. Maybe you have somebody in your life that's always a little bit like Jacob, always kind of a deceiver, always a grabber, always somebody who's trying to get ahead by pushing other people down. The problem with somebody who does this work, this deceiver, is that their world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Deception leads toward isolation. And that's what Jacob has. He has to run away because his circle has gotten so small. So he runs away to a distant family member. There he works for 14 years, develops a pretty significant amount of resources, materials. He gets married multiple times, has children with multiple women. Now he's got a big family, he's got an entourage, but he's deceived so much that he has to run away again. And so he comes back, he's going to go back toward his family. We're about to get to the scripture, stick with me here. But when he goes back, the problem is the person who's really mad at him, Esau, who wanted to kill him, is still there. So he develops a three-part plan. The first part of the plan is to send out scouts. Is Esau still there? Is Esau alive? Does Esau remember me? The scouts go, yep, they come back. Esau's alive. Uh, he has 400 men, and he's coming to you. Okay, part one of the plan's not going great. Second part of the plan, uh, 
gift baskets. Jacob sends gift baskets, and it's kind of a, a different type of gift basket than you would usually get. This gift basket is 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 female sheep, 20 rams, 30 female camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, and 30 donkeys. This is the whole zoo. Like, he sends all of it. This is a way that I can make a peace offering to Esau. The next part he does is what probably comes natural to some of us. He prays. He knows he's in trouble. And here's the prayer from Genesis 32, verse 11. This is Jacob's prayer to God. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. Now, it's my guess that this is not a one-time prayer of Jacob, right? Every step he took toward home, he's praying this prayer. Every step closer toward Esau, he's praying, God save me. My brother wanted to kill me. He probably still wants to kill me. I'm in trouble. Help me. Save me, save me, save me. The fourth part of his prayer is where we're going to pick up the story, or of his plan, is where we're going to pick up the story today. This is Exodus 32. We'll pick up verse 32. It says, That night Jacob got up and took his two wives and two female servants and his eleven sons and crossed the ford of the Jabbok, the river. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. Now put your finger in the text, hold on to it for a minute. What's Jacob just done? In the middle of the night, he's developed a plan to deceive his brother, to keep some of his resources away. If they come after me, they'll be safe, maybe. Or if they go after them, I'll be safe. Let's split up and make sure maybe one of us gets through this. So he sends scouts he sends gifts, he sends prayers, he sends his family, but now he has a problem. He's alone. He is completely alone, and he's likely at the very same river that he was at 14 years before. He ran away from his family, crossed the river, now he's coming back. It's interesting that God sometimes bring you, brings you back to the places where you made critical choices. Here's verse 24. This is the best part of the story. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, so his hip was wrenched, and he wrestled as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go until you bless me. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called that place Peniel, meaning or saying, it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel and he was limping because of his hip. Friends, I want to tell you a couple things about this scripture. God wrestles with people. God is a God who meets people in their mess. God is a God who changes people. And this story about Jacob and the dark night of his soul is so instructive, especially as we talk about prayer, about meeting up with God. Now, let's not make it complicated. Prayer is just simply connecting toward God. But it's also really rich in how it happens. I want to talk a little bit about prayer. I'm going to give you three points today. Here's the first one. Prayer is a lot like wrestling. In wrestling, we get close uncomfortably close to other people. We struggle to find a grip. We're tested. We learn our limits. We push. We're pulled. We find our balance. The same thing happens in prayer. We get really close to God, and we struggle to get a grip on what's happening, and we find our balance, and sometimes we push, and sometimes we pull, but we're trying to figure out our limits and our power. 
When we are in prayer, we're in the transformation zone. We're in the wrestling mat with God. I remember being a kid, I have two older brothers. At some point, we decided that we were stronger than our dad. My dad's a big, strong farmer with fingers that were two inches thick and forearms, unbelievable, very different than my makeup. And we would arm wrestle at dinner. We never, ever beat my dad, but we always wanted to. Why? Test our limit. How is my strength compared to yours? I had, as a young boy, I loved to wrestle with my friend and push people around and get pushed around. I didn't win many of those matches either. And now that I have children, they like to wrestle with me, right? Why? Because we want to test our limits and see our ability. Prayer is the same. We don't know our strength, our ability, until we push it up against someone else. I think it's actually really theologically significant that God blesses people who wrestle with him. That God blesses the wrestler. Because some of you grew up with a version of Christianity that was safe, sanitary, prim, and proper. And I'm here today to free you from that false version of Christianity. Because it's not biblical. The biblical version of Christianity, our religion, is people who wrestle with God. They wrestle with God thinking, relationally, physically, spiritually, emotionally, all the things. The heroes of Scripture are people who wrestle with God. Think of Abraham. God made Abraham big, huge promises. And Abraham, in his impatience, tried multiple times to take matters into his own hands. Take Moses. He wrestled with the challenges of being a leader of a stiff-necked people. He wrestled with them when they were in Egypt and in the wilderness. Take Job. He wrestled with the suffering of life. Why is life so unfair? Why do tragedies happen? Why have I lost my children? Take Hannah and Sarah and Elizabeth. They wrestled with infertility. Take David. He wrestled with sexual temptation and the mistakes of his past. Take Peter. He wrestled with control and safety. Thomas wrestled with his doubts. Paul wrestled with diversity. Do you wrestle with God? Do you allow yourself to wrestle with God? I know a lot of people in this room are hurting right now. You're hurting for a variety of reasons. But if you dared to bring that hurt to the mat with God, if you don't wrestle with God, to be honest, as your pastor, I'm a little concerned about you. Because every mature Christian I know has wrestled with God, has struggled with God, has had dark, late nights struggling through tears with God about why certain things are or are not happening. I wrestle with God with the unending challenges of Christian leadership. I wrestle with God. How on earth is the church supposed to inspire and re-engage a post Christian culture. I wrestle with a few pretty tricky theological issues that don't always seem so clear. I wrestle with my own doubts, my own fears, my own insecurities, my own effectiveness. I wrestle with God, and it's my wrestling that's brought me closer to God. Do you wrestle? Do you wrestle with God about the state of your career, about your singleness, or your marriage, or your family, or your future, or your past? Do you wrestle with God in this broken world? Paul in the New Testament has this one beautiful phrase. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I think you take out the words work out and put the word wrestle. Grapple with your salvation. Struggle with your salvation with fear and trembling. When you're a Christian, you don't stop asking tough questions. You don't stop praying for healing. You don't stop seeking justice. You do all of those things, but now you do them with a wrestling partner. You pray with God for healing. You pray with God for justice. You work with God to make his will happen on earth. A faithful Christian wrestles with God. They meet God in the mess of life. Now, you can read this story about Jacob and say, we should always be wrestling with God. 
Sometimes you wrestle with God. Sometimes you wrestle against God. In every circumstance, it's God who's accomplishing the good work that you and I both need. It's an unlikely tag team that God would tap us on the shoulder, but if there's breath in your lungs, that's what's happened. God has tapped you on the shoulder and said, this is the world. This is the world I've created. I've created you in this time, in this place, for these people, for this work. Tap, you're in. Go wrestle. Go make this world, the world I love, to be a better, more faithful experience of the kingdom of God. Prayer is a lot like wrestling. Second point, prayer is all about vulnerability with God. That night, Jacob, next to the river, is alone. And the more powerful your prayer is, is dependent on how vulnerable your prayer is. Jacob doesn't have money anymore. He sent that across the river. He doesn't have possessions. He doesn't have family. He doesn't have servants. He doesn't have anybody who owes him anything. It's just him. It's been years since he has been that vulnerable. But you know, you can't really mold clay when it's hard. You can't change a heart when it's hard. In prayer, our hearts soften just like clay softens with water. In prayer, our ideas go from my will be done toward thy will be done. When you go to God in prayer, you make yourself vulnerable. What about if God doesn't give me what I want? What about if God doesn't answer my prayer? What about if God gives me the exact opposite of what I think I need? I have to trust God when I pray. When I pray. What makes your best relationships in your life the most significant is when you have people who know you and love you, right? If you have somebody who knows you and loves you, you feel safe around them. You're willing to be vulnerable with them because they know you know they're going to take care of you. Well, that's what God does with you. God knows you. God knows what you need. He knows your struggles. He knows your heart. And he loves you. So you can go with confidence to God in prayer. You can be vulnerable because he has your best interest in mind. The problem is many of you don't like vulnerability. And by many, I mean all of you. Right? We hate vulnerability. We don't like to look like we're weak incapable that we're going to struggle and yet that is the place of transformation that's why so many people would rather watch church online than go in person i don't want to be vulnerable i don't want to join a small group i don't want to be vulnerable i don't want to tell somebody what's really going on when they ask me good questions i don't want to be vulnerable i've said this before god doesn't take hostages god won't force you to give up what you won't give up He won't heal what you won't give. He won't clean what you won't give. He won't redeem what you won't let go of. There's power in vulnerability, but you have to surrender. David Brenner's a Christian writer and thinker, and I appreciate what he says is the first step in Christian spiritual transformation. He says, the first step is death to the kingdom of self, an awakening to a new life of surrender to perfect love. If you want to be changed, the first thing you need to do is give up on saving yourself. Surrender to a God who is perfectly loving. That's what God did when he met Jacob in the river. He came and answered Jacob's prayer. Remember Jacob's prayer? God save me from my brother because I'm afraid he's going to kill me and my whole family. How did God answer his prayer? By changing Jacob by meeting Jacob, by wrestling with him in vulnerability. What does Jesus say to us who come to him? Repent and be baptized. Turn around, follow me, do a 180, give up on your old way, follow me in a new way. David Benner writes later on, he said, the key to spiritual transformation is meeting God in vulnerability. So I wonder for you, Is that in the way? Is that what's holding you back from a deeper relationship with God, a real relationship with God? Do you refuse to be honest with God? Does prayer change you? I think so, but only if you're willing to be vulnerable. It's not a coincidence that this moment, this night next to the river, is Jacob's defining moment. He will no longer be Jacob. He is now Israel. 
Israel, a name that means people who wrestle with God. What if that was the real legacy of Israel? Not a nation defined by global conflict, not a nation that's found itself on the inside or outside of power struggles, but what if Israel's real legacy, the legacy of God's people, is people who wrestle with God? Third point, prayer is confronting reality, the truth. You know, when we read, we read this story at the beginning, they leave out the details. So we assume the person Jacob is fighting is his brother Esau, right? That's who we're led to think it's supposed to be. It's only in the middle of the story that we realize Jacob's been fighting God. But in truth, Jacob has been fighting God his entire life. From birth until that moment, from grabbing his brother's heel to tricking his father to tricking his father-in-law, he has always been wrestling with God about how does he live his life. God needs to humble him. So in this moment, with no one else to call out to, no one else to help him, he wrestles. But by God's grace, God wrestles at Jacob's level. He drops a couple weight classes, right? And we know this is true, because if God wanted to kill Jacob, he could have done it instantly. Because all it took was the pinky finger of God on his hip, and his hip is completely wretched for the rest of his life. But God in his grace doesn't give him what he deserves. Instead, he meets him at his level and allows him to wrestle to learn his limits, to receive the blessing. This is what the good news of the gospel is, isn't it? The father allows the punishment that's due to us to be absorbed by his son. The sin that belongs to us goes to Christ and instead we get Christ's gifts of new life. God could have smited him, but he didn't. For Jacob's sake and for the sake of the gospel, he let Jacob wrestle. God is letting you wrestle with him. God is letting you struggle against your limits for your benefit. And then there's this exchange about the names. You're no longer Jacob, you're Israel, for you struggle with God. I'm here to tell you, as you look to develop your spiritual life, as you, as you desire to grow deeper in your faith, you might want to start wrestling with reality. If life is hard, bring it to God. If you're depressed, bring it to God. If you're upset, angry, bring it to God. If you're grieving, bring it to God. If you're confused, bring it to God. Meet him on the wrestling mat of your life. Allow the mess of your circumstance to be the invitation to connect with God. The truth is Jacob needed to be changed. But before he could be the brother he needed to be, the husband he needed to be, the father he needed to be, he needed to be changed by God. So I ask you, do you need to be changed? Does your heart need to be softened? Is there some part of you that God needs to redeem for a greater good? If you want to be changed, start praying. We go to prayer to be changed by God. If you don't want to be changed, don't pray. It is that simple. But if you're willing to be changed, then let God change you. At times, God's going to change your will. At times, God's going to change your perspective. At times, God's going to change your heart. But you know what's never going to change? God will never change. He is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. He's always strong, always kind, always good, always loving, and always working in all things for your good. So let's recap this, and I'll end it with a comparison of Christianity versus global religions. Prayer is wrestling with God. Prayer is vulnerability with God. Prayer is confronting reality with God's help. Now, if you've studied any of the world religions at any length, you would know that this idea of wrestling with God is unique to Christianity. Allah is not a God to be messed with, wrestled with. We don't get that personal of a relationship with Allah. The Hindu gods are not interested in your real life struggle. Buddha says your struggle is within you. The gods of the Romans and the Greeks, they were regular fighters fighting often with each other and times with humans, but never for their good, always for their own. Only the God we find in the Christian scriptures invites you to know him through your struggles, to wrestle with him. In a different book written by Philip Yancey, he writes these words. The Buddhist eightfold path, the Hindu doctrine of karma, the Jewish covenant, the Muslim code of law, each of those offers a way to 
earn approval. Only Christianity dares to make God's love unconditional. The God Christians worship loves sinners, redeems failures, delights in second chances and fresh starts, and never tires of pursuing lost sheep, waiting for the prodigal children, or rescuing those damaged by life and left on the sides of the path. In this book that we're reading right now as a congregation this summer on prayer, Philip Yancey tells a story of a hospice chaplain. Some of you maybe read that in the last week as you prepared for this week. The chaplain was meeting with a client, and the client was in great emotional distress. He was in the last stages of battling cancer and was feeling very guilty for he'd spent the night before ranting and raving and swearing at God. The following morning, he felt dreadful. He imagined that his only chance of eternal life was just thrown away, lost forever. How could God ever forgive someone who had cursed at him and ranted and raved against him? The hospital chaplain, the hospice chaplain asked the patient a question. What do you think is the opposite of love? The man replied, hate. Very wisely, the chaplain said, no, the opposite of love is indifference. You have not been indifferent to God, or you would have never spent the entire night talking to him, honestly telling him what's on your heart and mind. Do you know the Christian word that describes what you did last night? The word is prayer. You spent last night praying. Dear brothers and sisters, does prayer change you? If you're honest, a real conversation with God will change you completely. Those who surrender, obey. Not all who obey surrender. It's easy to obey God for the wrong reasons. God doesn't just want your behavior. He wants your heart and he finds it on the wrestling mat. Do you need to be changed? Do you need to be humble? Do you need to deal with the mess, past or present? God stands, waiting in the dark night next to the river crossing, waiting for you to make a journey to your new identity, your new future. Will you get close? Will you wrestle him? We all, like Jacob, need God to confront us, touch us, and change us. May God meet you in your willingness to be vulnerable with him. Amen. Let's pray. Faithful and loving God, you are good. You are kind. You are love. You are strong. And your mercy is new to us every single day morning. The voices in our head and the messages of our culture would tell us that we are unworthy, and yet you have made us worthy by your love and sacrifice. So Lord, we pray that we would have the courage to meet you, and in meeting you, to find you to be a loving Father, a gracious Lord. Change us, Lord, by our encounters with you. We ask these things in Jesus, our Lord's name. Amen.